BackgammonGalaxy.com presents Backgammon Pro Analysis. What's up, my boys? This is Mark Olson, Grandmaster from BackgammonGalaxy.com. Lately, a lot of people have been asking me how I organize my position database. Since this is a topic that a lot of aspiring players are interested in, I figured that I was going to try to make a video about this topic. Making a position database is, in my opinion, besides from playing and competing and analyzing, the best way of improving your game. The way I do it is that I look at a given blunder or an interesting position, I figure out what category I want to categorize it in, and then I save it in my position database, which is usually just screenshots in a folder system. Um, so the key to this exercise making a position database is to have the ability to categorize positions obviously some positions might be quite straightforward while other positions are by definition more complicated uh, there are no rights and wrongs in this topic you can categorize positions in whatever way you feel like doing it in this video, I'm going to show my way of doing it. Um, um, if you have any comments or points of discussion, please let me know in the comments and I'll try to interact with your comments because for sure this is something that I am also developing as I go along in my backgammon career and my position database today doesn't look like my position database five or seven years ago. So it's definitely something that you evolve or develop over time. Okay, without further ado, let's get going. So first category is the opening game. In my definition, an opening game position are the positions that occur within the first four rolls of the game, basically. So there are all kinds of variations in the opening game, as you know, the opening game um, since all since the starting position is the same in every game, uh, the the objectives of the opening game are to try to develop, try to if you're have uh, if you're up in the race, you want to try to get an advanced anger, minimize contacts, running. If you're down in the race, you want to start building a prime. You're basically trying to maximize all four of your major game plans simultaneously, and depending on what dice you get, that will lead the game in one strategic direction or another. Okay, let's move on to the next position category here. Um, this is a category that I like to call middle game positions. This is the broadest category. Um, the middle game position typically occurs after the opening game and the way I define the middle game is that both players have back checkers and both players are trying to impose their offensive game plans, which are Prime, Blitz, and Race. So both players have all of these game plans going on. Uh, at some point, one player might get a good lead in the race, and uh, so he his game plan will be to try to race, while the, the other player might start aiming for maximizing his contact value, which is the fourth game uh, major game plan so um, in middle game positions you basically uh, still try to maximize your equity in all four of the major game plans since the game hasn't gone into a specific defined state category yet it will of course but it hasn't done so yet okay next category we have the blitz everyone knows the blitz of course the blitz is the position type where you are attacking and you're building inner points you don't care too much about purity so the deeper points here are almost as valuable as the more pure points up here uh, you're not really trying to build a prime you're trying to maximize oh sorry you're trying to maximize the number of checkers in the zone that's your ammunition to the blitz you're trying to build in a in a point boards and you're trying to put your opponent on the bar and continue to put him on the bar until you reach a full close out of your inner board that's the blitz um, the way i categorize the blitz um, 
is that you need to have some sort of attack. So the opponent has to be on the bar or under severe pressure of being put on the bar. That's the first indication of the blitz. Uh, another, um, how do you say that? Another condition which isn't, it's, it's, it's not sufficient. No, sorry, it's sufficient but not necessary is that you need to build in a in a board points oh i keep pressing the wrong button here um in a priming game plan you definitely prefer to build the pure po points here in your prime zone because you want to block your opponent in the blitz it doesn't really matter too much however you could have a blitz where you also have a prime structure the the way i define a blitz is simply just that your opponent's on the bar and you are trying to go for a closeout. That's a blitz in my eyes. Okay, let's move on. Okay, another very standard position type is the long race. Uh, it happens in a lot of the games we play that uh, we get into a racing situation here and it's basically just the pip count that tells you who's ahead and it's just a dice game. Very little strategy is left in this game. Uh, of course, there's some. You want to try to get, bring your checkers in here with minimum, minimal effort while still retaining a good bear-off distribution. Usually, we're aiming for this bear-off triangle here where we have 5 on the 6, 4 on the 5, 3 on the th 4, and so on, making this tri triangular formation. Uh, usually, this triangle gives you the optimal efficiency where you have spent least possible effort bringing your checkers into your home board while still maximizing your bear off distribution. Okay, next position type, the bear off race. So it's a very similar to the long race. I could have categorized it in one category. The reason I chose to make it a separate category is that in a bear off race, uh, the pip count is not always indicative of the true uh, equity uh, in this position of the true winning chances. There can be a lot of details coming up here. For instance, here blue has a gap on the two point that slows down his bear off. He has some wastage here with these two additional checkers on the ace point also giving him some wastage. Whereas white has very low wastage. He has a very nice structure here, a little bit backloaded. So he will have optimal efficiency with his dice rolls while blue will have some wastage. So uh, oh, and another thing, uh, also the number of checkers you have off here, uh, the fact that white has one more checker off means a lot in this type of bear-off position. And even though blue is way ahead in the pip count, actually, because this is a very short race, in actuality, blue is not that much ahead here because of all the other variables in the position. So that's the, that's the bear-off race. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so here we have bear off with contact. They come in a lot of different variations. In this variation, white is on the bar, so that is per, per definition still contact. Uh, and here you might get some decisions whether you want to bear off aggressively uh, or if you want to play safe and start clearing points and stuff like that. Uh, the contact uh, could also come in a variation where he has either one man back or an anger at some place in here in the inner board, uh, he might even have two checkers there or uh, checkers on two different points. So there are many different kind of variations here in the bear off with contact positions. Very actually quite a broad category. Okay, let's move on. Uh, yeah, this is the another racing type position where the pip count is definitely not indicative if you have read the chapter in my newest book, Cube Like a Boss, you will probably know these types of positions. We call them roll versus roll positions because rather than looking at the pip count, we count how many rolls each player ha have left before he bear off all his checkers, assuming that he doesn't roll a double. So in this case, blue has 13 checkers left. That would make this a seven roll position, given that he doesn't roll a double. White has six roll left here and uh, that would give him a three roll position so of course white is winning this game basically a gin position here nothing interesting about the position per se it's just to show you the 
an example of a position from this category. Next up, we have the mutual holding game. These games are also very race oriented. Uh, the pip count and the race is one of the most crucial factors in this in this uh, category. Um, the definition of a mutual holding game is that both players have an advanced anger and there isn't really a lot of blitzing or priming going on in the position. Usually the, the, the pip count and the location of the angers dictate the strategy. Uh, it's it's usually an advantage to have the more advanced um, anger. So in this case, blue would have a slight edge in the position. And it's also usually advantageous to be up in the race and leading in race value, even though because of the timing, there is some of the race value being offset by the opponent's contact value. So that's like a counteracting mechanism. The more you're up in the race, the better timing and contact the opponent has. Usually, uh, if you increase your race equity, it will that the net effect will be positive, meaning that the counteraction of contact value is less than the race value uh, you gained. So usually, it's an advantage to be up in the race. Next position type, the one-way holding game. Okay, so the one-way holding game is just as a mutual holding game, uh, except for this time, one of the players have fully escaped their back checkers. And it's just the other player holding an advanced anger and trying to hit a shot. In the one-way holding games, because of the nature of the position, priming and blitzing is basically not existent. It's not ex completely true because you do have some positions where there's a little bit of priming, a little bit of blitzing. For instance, in this actual position, there is actually blitz value for white because blue is on the bar. This is a variation of a holding game where you have extra checkers. And in this, this case, blue's extra checkers on the bar. It could have also been here on the 23 point. Um, but usually prime and blitz value is quite low in holding games, potentially all the way down to zero. So it's very much race and contact uh, value oriented. In this case, White is leading big time in the race. That's his game plan. He wants to clear from the rear, clear his points, bring his checkers home, avoid getting hit. While Blue is trying to do the exact opposite. He's trying to hold contact and hit a turnaround shot to win the game. And while he waits for the shot, he's trying to build up a, the strongest possible prime formation over here in his own side of the board. In this particular variation where we have a, a checker here on the on the bar, blue needs to survive the blitz first, come in from the bar, and then start the holding game uh, and the, trying to play for contact. Um, yeah, so we have variations of the holding game here. We have the, the standard uh, holding game where the opponent, uh, one of the players have an anger and and no additional checkers are in the mix. So we can call that the standard uh, holding game. Oh, ah, that was a mistake. And we have the uh, we have the variations where you have extra contact with a checker. Uh, for instance, a goalkeeper, sometimes you have an advanced anger and then you have a, a, a deep checker here maximizing the contact zone. It does increase contact value. However, it's also vulnerable to getting blitzed. So it, it, at the same time, increases your opponent's blitz value, which is bad. So it's a, it it has counteracting effects. Um, so that's the the goalkeeper variations. Let's call it DK goalkeeper variations. And then you have the blitz variations, which are very po powerful for the offensive player since he gets the high winning probability of a holding game and some gamma rates of a blitz. So that's the case here. That's why White has such a strong position here because it's one of the variations where he actually has blitz value. Okay, let's move on. Then we have a deep anger game. So in my definition, a holding game is defined by, well, you could say the broader category it, is a contact game. Let's call it like contact. And within the, the range of contact or within the the umbrella of contact positions, you have 
all the holding games, all the deep anger games, all the back games, all the one man holding games, a lot of different position types. Uh, rather than taking this one very broad category, I subdivided them into the more reasonable uh, categories that we usually talk about the positions. Uh, the, the broader category is not really useful for us. Um, so the way I define a holding game is that you have an advanced anger, typically on your opponent's bar point or on one of the higher points here, which would be the four, five, or six point. Of course, very rarely on the six point, since usually your opponent has that point occupied. And the uh, deep anger games are the uh, games where either you or the opponent have an anger on the deeper points, which are the ace point or the deuce point. Okay, so what about the three point here? Yeah, we'll get to that one in the next category. Um, yeah, so this is a deep anger game, and, and the deep anger game also has variations. It has the ace point game, and it has the deuce point game. And then it also, each of those have variations <laughs> My dog is just making yawning sounds. Um, each of these have variations where you have extra contact. So you have an extra checker here, for instance. Uh, extra contact, in this case, in this particular position. <laughs> My dog is making noises. In this particular position, uh, there's an extra checker here, and there's the variation of no extra contact. And exactly the same for the deuce game here, uh, extra and and no, n no extra. So you can see there's a lot of different variation types, but in this uh, category, I just lump them all together, together and say the deep anger games are the ones where. Oh yeah, by the way, f uh, first criteria: it has to be a defined state position. Defined. defined state and with a defined state I mean that one of the players have fully escaped their back checkers as in the position at hand here the blues back checkers are fully escaped and thereby all of the offense of white is non-existent this is a defined game defined state game all of white's equity comes from race and contact that's it there's no priming there's no blitzing blue however does have prime and blitz going on but for the most part this is actually just a race uh, the fact that there's an extra it's one of the variations where there's an extra blood gives some additional blitz value to the offensive player and uh, that makes it a little bit more complicated okay let's move on let me just uh, get my dog out of the out of my office I'll be back in 10 seconds Okay, I'm back. Dog life. Um, okay, that was the deep anger game. Let's move on. And then we have the three-point anger game, which I just talked about briefly. The three-point anger game is a hybrid between the deep anger and the advanced anger holding games. So it's right in the middle, which means it has the some of the characteristics of each. It has the racing oriented uh, game plan from the advanced anchor uh, holding games and it has it also has the the contact aspect of the the deep anger um, games so it's very difficult uh, to s pinpoint exactly what your strategy is here it's going to be a mix of the contact of the deep and the race of the race and contact of the advanced anchor holding games it's somewhere in between. Um, that makes it a little bit more complicated. And that's why I categorize the three-point anchor games in its own category. 
Oh, what did I just do? I just exited the whole thing. Okay, yeah, we're back. Um, okay, another type, the no anger holding games. These are typically problematic because the position here looks as if it's a holding game. It's a defined stained state since White has escaped fully his all of his back checkers. Actually, there's a little bit of extra contact here because the checkers are on the 14 point, not on 13. But for the sake of simplicity, we call this a defined state. White is fully escaped. Black doesn't have any offense. He has to rely on the defensive game plan of contact. And you could say that if you get lucky and roll some high doubles, he also has a little bit of race value. But priming and blitzing, there is nothing. He has zero prime value and blitz value here since the opponent has escaped all of his back checkers. The no anger holding games are very problematic because from White's perspective, he actually does have both blitzing and prime value. The fact that blue doesn't have an anger makes him vulnerable for the blitz. Um, so usually in these types of positions the offensive player have has the race value of a holding game <coughs> but rather than having zero blitz value he has a lot of blitz value <laughs> which makes this position even stronger than a usual holding game and that's why for the most part you have to let you have to drop uh, the cube in the in a no angle holding game if you're getting cubed in this actual position even though white doesn't even have any new points developed in his inner board it's a big pass here it's a one and a half blunder to 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 take it from blue's perspective and down here we can see that white has high winning chances 75% as if it was a normal holding game but he wins a staggering amount of 17.4% gammons and for that reason the no anger holding games are generally quite weak next category we have the one man back um, you, some people call it one man back holding game we could call it that if you want uh, oh oops one man back holding um, the definition here of a one man back is again one of the players have fully escaped their back checkers which gives us a defined state position and um, the other player hasn't he has quite specifically one checker back and thereby the name um, one checker here is vulnerable for the blitz, so it doesn't have the contact value of a holding game. However, uh, it's much easier to race since now you just have one checker to jump and escape, get into a race, rather than two. It's very, very, very difficult to start uh, racing if you have two checkers trapped, like in a holding game or deep anger game. But with one checker back, it's completely doable. And for that reason, the race is crucial in the one man back positions. Um, there are variations where the defensive player, that is the player with the one man back, is actually up in the race and in that case his game plan is simply just to jump out and try to get into a race. So that's the variations where the defensive player, call him DP, is up in the race and there's the variations where the defensive player is down in the race. And in that case, the strategy is to play it more or less like a holding game where you have to try to maximize your contact value as well. Since you don't have too much contact value with just a single checker, you can't form an anger and you're vulnerable for the blitz, you can't really take the cube if you're down too much in the race. You need to have race value in these positions as well as the defensive player. So, okay, that's the one man back cube category, uh, not necessarily cube that's the one man back positional category moving on six prime positions um, there is definitely something special going on when a player goes from having a five prime to a six prime it changes the strategy he can play more freely of course depending on the opponent's prime structure as well um, but it's a 
specific uh, category and I choose to put it in its own category rather than saying it's a middle game or anger game or whatever I'd like to call it a six prime position and uh, yeah because a lot of special strategy uh, arrives when you get into a, a six prime position um, so that's why I like to to keep that as its own category uh, moving on late game contact aha uh -huh. we already saw some late game positions when we looked at the race and the other types of defined state positions um, the late game contact are the positions where we are a little bit later in the game than a normal holding game uh, we are at the final stages of contact and usually it's just like a couple of checkers left that needs to be cleared or one or two checkers that needs to be yeah it yeah, needs to be cleared and one or two checkers that are holding the contact so in this case white has two checkers here to, to, to hold contact and uh, I again this is similar to a holding game where it's the race and it's the contact value that dominates these are the two primary game plans but of course as we have in this position for the offensive player there's definitely blitzing and racing going on and in this particular position it would be more of a blitz uh, value for for blue here because white has two vulnerable shots and he's vulnerable for an attack here blue rolled the ro rolled three one so he of course he's gonna hit put a checker on the bar and probably just play safe like this only leaving a four six shot from the bar con solidifying the race and uh, and as well um, uh, maximizing your blitz value and the potential of winning a gammon here. Okay, let's move on. One moment, guys. I'll be back in a, in twenty seconds. dog back in the office it was freezing out on the terrace um, okay so where were we early back game positions okay so a lot of you guys are familiar with the back game so the way that I like to categorize the back games are in three different stages I have the early which is a position that we have at hand here where the early back game positions are the ones that are kind of like middle game positions where both players have back checkers and for that reason white still has some for either some forward game plan going on not just back game plan um, yeah I would say that's it that white still has some offense here he doesn't just rely on the contact value from the back game um, so in the early back game positions the game hasn't been defined yet it's not a defined state position this could go into a holding game or a priming game it doesn't necessarily have to resolve in a, a result in a back game position um, even though at the moment it is and it's looking it's we're heading towards a back game position in the early back game there are still some probability that we're gonna have a different type of end game position than a back game Okay, so moving on here uh, to the mid stage back game position. Here we have uh, the offensive player having escaped all of his back checkers, but he still hasn't begun his bearing yet against the back checker. So we are in a defined state, state position now. This is a back game. It's not a priming game. It's not a holding game. This is a back game. It's clearly defined. Um, yeah, the game plans for both players are clearly defined here, and uh, but we're not in the late stage of a back game because White hasn't begun, or the offensive player hasn't begun his his bearing of checkers yet. So moving on to the late stage of the back game. 
Um, by the way, this is something that I talk about a lot in my new book, Cube Like a Boss, uh, in the back game chapter, how I categorize and how I distinguish the different variations of the back games. Um, so here we have the first categorization, which is early, mid or late stage of the back game. And in this position, it's a late stage because now White is definitely starting to clear his points and bringing his checkers in. Uh, and this is a deep back game, and it's definitely uh, in the late stage. Okay, so we have, uh, just to, to summarize here, we have two different categories of the, sorry, three different categories of the, of the stage that the back game is in. It can be in the uh, early, mid, and late. And actually, then I have another three subcategories of each of these categories. So I have another, yeah, three variations here. It's the same uh, type, just we, we do this um, categorization of, in all three of these categories. And the three subcategories in each of them are whether it's a deep back game, if it's a mid-range back game, or if it's a shallow back game. That's another category that I, oh, oops, shallow. Uh, that's another uh, categorization that I make. I wouldn't put up nine different back game categories in this video. I prefer just to put the three and then tell you about the three subcategories of each of them uh, and how I categorize that. The deep back games are the ones where the angers are, oh, actually this one as well, where the angers are the, 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 the what do you call it, the uh, most advanced of the back game angers, in this case, the anger here in the deuce point, if that's on the th three or the two point. So basically it's the one two, it's the one three, and it's the two three back game. Those I categorize as deep back games. If the most advanced anger is on the four point, so that would make it the one four, two four, three four back games. That is a mid, mid range back game. And if the rearmost anger is on the five point, I call it a shallow back game. So that the five point, that would be the one five, two five, three five, and the four five back games. Those are the shallow back games. And each of these categories have different uh, timing sweet spots. Again, something I talk a lot about in my uh, new book, Cube Like a Boss. And they also have different um, character characteristics in terms of when you get to hit, uh, when you typically get to hit uh, a check or when you get the possibility of hitting a shot. And it also has um, different characteristics in terms of winning chances and gammon yeah, winning rates and gammon rates. Usually the deeper back games, uh, you win more as the defensive player, given that you have good timing, but you lose more gammons and back gammons. And as we get more and more shallow, the winning chance, the winning probability of the defensive player goes down. However, you lose less gammons and back gammons. And overall, you can't really say that one back game is better than the other. It completely depends on the position and the timing and the mobility and structure and all those variables that are that are uh, crucial in a back game position. Okay, moving on from the back game here. Uh, here we have the containment game, uh, which is a category that, again, we see quite often. Either this usually happens uh, in, in the stage that I call the post late hit. So either you've been in a back game or a deep anger game or some sort of end game contact game and you were lucky enough to hit a turnaround shot. Now you are in a position where you need to contain that hit checker, and that's your only way to win, because your opponent is already born off checkers, and you wanna make a six prime and roll the prime all the way forward, get a close out, and then win the race. Sometimes you wanna try to fish for more checkers here. Uh, that's one variation. Um, and then there's also the variation where you, basically can't really contain the back checker because perhaps you have 
buried some checkers or something like this, or or your opponent has too many checkers off, maybe has 14 checkers off. So your objective is not really to to contain, to win the game, it's to contain, to basically just save the gammon. And uh, yeah, so that's the variations here. You have the, 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 the pure containment, where you contain to win, contain to win, and then you have the ones where you contain to save gammon, contain to save gammon, uh, and some hybrids in between where you might try to do both simultaneously. Um, yeah, and you also have the variations where you fishing for more checkers. Like this would definitely be a position uh, where you where, where the offensive player in this case blue is trying to fish for more checkers. Fish, go fishing. Okay, that's the contact, the containment game. Uh, okay, here we have the stag and straggler. Actually, I should have categorized this one uh, alongside with the other uh, racing positions that we have because basically this is just a race. Uh, it's not a roll versus roll position, but it's pretty close to being that. Uh, white, uh, or, or the way that we define it is that one side has a bear off position. Oh, well, there's actually one checker here. And the other side has like one dangling checker that he has to bring all the way around and then the rest is stacked up here on the deep point. So this is a stag and straggler race. I don't know where this name came from. If any of you guys know, please let me know in the in the comments because I have no idea. I guess the stag, I would say is probably this one. But the stra isn't he also the straggler with this checker? Or is maybe I don't know what exactly what straggler means in English. Yeah, straggler, I should look it up. Anyway, if you guys know how why it's called a stag and straggler, please enlighten me. Moving on. The prime versus prime. This is a very famous type of position. It's a... Uh, very how can you say it it's very characteristic for the game of backgammon uh it's quite beautiful in some way it's also very tactical uh sometimes some some call it the the priming battle or the battle of the primes and some call it just prime versus prime the the way it's categorized is that both players have priming structure going on and both players have an active um, game plan or an active value in terms of priming. So in this case, blue has two checkers trapped behind a four prime, and uh, white has one checker trapped behind a five prime. Here, um, in the priming uh, battles or in the prime versus prime uh, structure, of course, matters because whoever can trap your opponent's your opponent the longest has the uh, advantage in terms of timing because the other player will eventually crunch his position and that is usually game over in a priming battle whoever crunches first is usually the one that's gonna lose um, so at the same time you're trying to escape your opponent's prime here so white would try to escape the prime uh, Black, uh, blue, of course, is trying to prevent that from happening, trying to block as much as possible. And as well, blue is also trying to see if he can pick up another checker. Uh, the more checkers you prime, the stronger your prime value becomes. This actual position is is is, is a double, because I, I can see here it's a match from back in the galaxy, and I missed the double here. Um, it's a 13-point match. And I'm five away, your opponent is three away, and actually I missed a double here because I had the double shot on the blood here. And sending a second checker back behind a five prime, that would be very strong. Um, yeah. So the prime versus prime are defined with both players having back checkers, and both players have an active prime value going on. That's a prime versus prime. And the, the main uh, variables are structure, Timing, mobil oh, oops, timing. It's very difficult to write with this pen here. Timing, mobility, and flexibility. Let's just call it flex. That's the standard. Uh, this was structure up here. 
um, that's the standard variables that we are interested in. Um, notice that the race is not really too much of a concern. It's much more about timing and trying to get your opponent to crunch his front position. Again, uh, a very interesting position. There are so many subcategories that I'm not even going to list them here because there's so many variations. You can categorize them in terms of how many checkers you have back, like two versus one. You can categorize this in, in terms of how the structure is. If there's a gap in the structure, perhaps blue didn't have the four point, but instead had the three point. Uh, there's variations where the other player has checkers on the bar. There are so many different variations in the prime versus prime that we can't really keep up with them. Uh, but it's definitely a very important uh, category type. Let's move on. Blitz versus prime. Okay, so similar to the previous one where it was prime versus prime. In this case, it's just one player blitzing and the other player priming. And this actual uh, position here, white would be the blitzing player since he has a quarter checker on the bar. He has four point board, four point inner board here. And he is trying to continue with the blitz, make uh, fill out the, the, the remaining two inner board gaps and try to go for the full closeout while also escaping his back checkers here. And for blue perspective, blue is simply just trying to prime. Um, so if we were to write out the value equation, prime, blitz, race, and contact, you can see that white is playing for blitz and race, and blue is playing for prime and contact. And uh, actually, this is quite an even position. White is a pretty big equity favorite because of the gamuns here. But in terms of winning chances, it's pretty close who are winning in this position. Um, yeah, so that's the blitz versus prime. Again, a ton of sub variations in the blitz versus prime. So it's quite a broad category. Crunch positions. Okay, these positions are actually very important to understand. A lot of people don't spend enough time understanding the crunching positions and when they then when they occur, they make huge blunders. The way I define a crunch position is that we are in a middle game, middle game-ish position. And when I say that, I mean that both checkers have back checkers. Because if if one checker has full freedom, let's say the three checkers here, uh, blues three checkers on the 22 point were over here around in his in his own side of the board, for instance, on the nine point, he would have full freedom. Then it's not really a crunch position anymore that he has these checkers buried because it might just have been moves he made to play safe and it's not that bad as long as you can still clear the rest of your points. The problem in the crunch positions, uh, the problem with, uh, with these buried checkers in a crunch position is that when you still have a middle game position, middle game-ish position, meaning that both checkers have back, both players have back checkers and both players are still trying to impose all four of their game plans then having dead checkers down here in the graveyard is just such a big disadvantage in terms of all of your offense so it decreases your offensive uh, power and uh, thereby since backgammon is a zero-sum game increases the opponent's value in all of these game plans um, Crunch is definitely something to, to be avoided and that's why we one of the first things you teach beginners uh, is to stop burying checkers. We need to use our checkers efficiently. Uh, it's a scarce resource. We need them to prime, blitz and race. And uh, the only thing you're doing when, when burying checkers is thinking about safety and the race, but completely ne neglecting the three other major game plans. Um, so the definition was that it's a position where one or both players have buried checkers and we are still in a middle game where both players have back checkers. That's the definition of a crunch. Okay, moving on. Um, this category I like to call a hypergammon position. 
And why do I call it that? If any of you guys are familiar with the backgammon variation called hypergammon, it's a game where instead of 15 checkers, you get three checkers and they begin at the opponent's one, two, and three point, and so does the opponent. And from here on, you apply the exact same uh, backgammon rules. You just have three checkers instead of 15. So in hypergammon, what's special about hypergammon is it's a, it's a much shorter race than a normal game of backgammon, and it's very tactical. So when I see a position like this, where uh, there's basically just, the whole game is just moving a couple of checkers. In this case, white, blue has these two checkers and white has one checker here. The rest are pretty much insignificant. All of the movement now will come with these checkers, more or less, at least all of the crucial movement. And, uh, and that, for that reason, I call it hypergammon. And in hypergammon, the lesson number one from hypergammon is that you have to be aware of tactics. So please make sure that you look at the dice combinations because hypergammon positions are highly tactical. Again, something that I emphasize in my books, uh, especially the, the newest book, Cube Like a Boss. Uh, you could also call these positions late game, co late game contact. I would be okay with that as well. And uh, there's definitely some overlap. Uh, usually the late game contact, I define them where... Um, the contact is, is a little bit more well-defined. There's not really too much movement going on. Whereas in this position we have here, there will be some movement. There might even be some hitting back and forth. The game is not really defined by the next sequence, so to say. Maybe maybe you could, maybe I should have just lumped those two categories together, but that's the way I do it in my position database. I differentiate between hypergammon and late game contact. Uh, that's it. That was it. Okay. I think that was 24 different uh, position categories. Let me know what you think. Remember to like and subscribe to Backgammon Galaxy's YouTube channel. It really helps out a lot with uh, in terms of uh, triggering the YouTube algorithm, helping us to spread the backgammon love to the world. So don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you very much. And leave me comments. Uh, do you guys have, have categories that I haven't talked about here? Or do you have any comments or corrections or points of discussion? Let me know. I will read all of your comments and try to interact as well as possible. This is, as I started out by saying, a work in progress. Um, how to categorize backgammon positions. And it's a little bit of an art, even though I've tried to do fixed rules and structure to uh, achieve good, clear categorization of position. And by the way, let me say that if you are an intermediate or a beginner or something like this, the fact that you can categorize positions will help you out tremendously in your backgammon career. It will all of a sudden put a little bit of order into chaos and make it much easier for you to learn the strategy and the concepts that you have to apply in this type of position. Because basically, if you know all of these 24 position types and you know which strategies and concepts to apply, you are going to do pretty good. Uh, the, 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 usually the mistake is that you get into a position type where you don't know what the strategy and the concepts are. And that's when you make really big blunders. So for that reason alone, I really recommend you being able to categorize positions. And, uh, and then when you start to build your position database, you get a ton of positions in each category. You can start to look those positions over and deduct some general principles that Extreme Gammon seems to be following in this specific position category. Okay, guys. Remember to like and subscribe, and uh, I'll be looking forward to reading your comments. Take care. Bye.